Now, today's webinar is the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, a national platform and infrastructure for researchers and trainees. We have three distinguished speakers who will overview the CLSA for us today. First, Dr. Eve Jonet, the Scientific Director of the Institute of Aging of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, who jointly organized this webinar. He received his doctorate in neuroscience from the University of Montreal and completed postdoctoral training in neurophysiology and behavioral neuroscience. His principal research interests focus on the aging process and cognitive deficits in the aging. Next, Dr. Laura Griffiths will present on the CLSA platform and infrastructure. She is the Associate Scientific Director of the CLSA and an Associate Professor at McMaster University in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence, and Impact. She holds a PhD in Epidemiology from the University of Toronto. Her research interests include physical functioning, injury, and aging, as well as harmonization of longitudinal data. Third, we will have Christy Castanian, a doctoral student of Epidemiology from York University School of Kinesiology and Health Science who will share her experience using the CLSA as a trainee. Finally, remember that there will be a question and answer session at the very end of the webinar, but feel free to add any comments or questions as we go along in the chat box. So first, we welcome Dr. Eve Jonette, who has a couple of words of introduction and welcome. Dr. Jonette? Thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, today from uh, from Whitehorse, in fact, Yukon, where uh, the third pathways for equity uh, for uh, health in the indigenous population is occurring, another important aspect uh, of the CIHR work. But uh, the CLSA, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, is really, really something that is very important for uh, CIHR, for all the uh, institutes, uh, it's something that has been prepared uh, since a long time. We've invested uh, approximately $80 million since 2003 to develop the CLSA. It took a long time to develop the protocol to make sure that all the uh, questions and data would be collected in order to answer um, uh, all the questions on the determinants of uh, healthy aging uh, in a longitudinal uh, perspective. Um, the uh, data uh, are, in fact, not only for uh, the researchers who are traditionally associated with the Institute of Aging, but all uh, institutes at CIHR, whether it's diabetes, uh, heart, uh, public health, uh, environment, uh, and so on. So this is why uh, this is a unique platform. And in Canada, we don't have that much of those platforms. Uh, there's uh, uh, other countries, particularly the uh, northern Euro European countries, who have such platforms, uh, such a data platform, and uh, they're extremely used and particularly used by uh, trainees and young investigators. Um, everyone, of course, has, can have access and ask uh, questions to these data. But I would say, um, uh, trainees uh, and young investigators, you are in a privileged position uh, to ask those questions. Questions, because you don't need to uh, invest into creating a, a lab or a research infrastructures. The data are there. They're just there to be used. Uh, and you will hear about the conditions uh, for trainees that are encouraging trainees to use these data in the next uh, minutes. In fact, uh, out of all the uh, projects that have been approved, nearly 48%, uh, nearly 50% 50, 50 of all the applications were submitted by uh, trainees. And since last year uh, or, or so, the, uh, the data are now available from the first uh, tranche uh, uh, of uh, data. And of course, it will become more and more rich as we move forward, because as you will hear, uh, every three years, uh, these data will be uh, updated with a new point in time. And trainees and young investigators, I would say, um, uh, you're uh, in a privileged position uh, as well, because you will be able to follow this study for the next 20, 23, 25 years, uh, the time it will take to have all these data. So we count on you to uh, make use of these data and to really um, contribute to identify the uh, optimal conditions to uh, healthy aging in Canada, while at the same time uh, looking at the natural occurrences of some health challenges as time goes by. So um, without any uh, further delay, I would like to uh, just thank uh, the staff at CIHR, 
uh, Dr. Griffith and also Christy Kristanian uh, for participating in this um, webinar this morning. And I'm sure that at the end of the hour, you will have all the information. And I hope you'll be convinced that you have a unique platform that you could use for yourself and to help uh, health and wellness of the aging uh, population in Canada. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. So we'll move on to the second part of the presentation and um, Dr. Lauren Griffith. Dr. Thank Griffith? Thank you very much, Carol. I'm actually particularly um, excited to do this talk today because about 10 years ago, I started as a postdoc developing um, at McMaster University, and part of my postdoc was um, working on the CLSA in terms of the development. So I see the, I'm especially excited in terms of the opportunities for researchers, all researchers, but especially trainees. And I'm presenting this today on behalf of the CLSA principal investigators, uh, Dr. Parminder Reina at McMaster, uh, Dr. Cynthia, or, uh, Dr. Christina Wilson at McGill, and Dr. Susan Kirkland at Dalhousie, and of course for all of the CLSA research team across Canada. Okay. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of trouble getting my next slide, but I think I've got it now. So the learning objectives are really twofold. And the first is to understand the CLSA study design and become familiar with the CLSA data access process. But I think even more important is the second objective. And as Dr. Jeanette was saying, I think the CLSA is such an important resource for Canada. And so it's really to be inspired to use the CLSA research platform. So in terms of an overview, I'll talk a bit about the background of the CLSA, the study design, the study content and data collection, but as well about the current status and something about the demographics of our CLSA sample. And again, part of the big, one of the big focuses today is to talk about data access. And here actually you could see on the left-hand part of this slide, is um, some of the CLSA teams across the country who are collecting data as part of the CLSA. So the CLSA was a strategic initiative of the CIHR Institute of Aging, and it's been on the Canadian research agenda since 2001. As I said, there's three co-principal investigators, but it's really supported by more than 160 co-investigators from 26 institutions across Canada. And when I show you a bit more about the content, you will see, um, I think, one of the biggest strengths of the CLSA is the multidisciplinary focus. We have researchers and experts in the areas of biology, genetics, medicine, psychology, sociology, demography, um, nursing, economics, epidemiology, nutrition, and health services. All of them are helping us design the uh, breadth of data that are need to, needed to answer important interdisciplinary questions. And again, as noted, um, the CLSA is the largest study of its kind to date in Canada in terms of the breadth and depth. And we're actually following more than 50,000 participants, and we'll be following them for over 20 years. Um, the aim of the CLSA is to examine life and health tra transitions and capture tra trajectories to enable the identification of modifiable factors with the potential to inform interventions for prevention, treatment, and impact to improve the health of populations as they age. And as you can see here, the aim is a fairly high level aim. In terms of the CLSA, our funding is really to collect data that are made available then to researchers. So it's not a specific study that would have very specific aims and research questions. It's one that is collected so that we can, and that we can answer a number. Of, of research questions. And that really falls in line with our vision, which is to create a research platform infrastructure to enable state-of-the-art 
interdisciplinary population-based research and evidence-based decision-making that will lead to the better health and quality of life of Canadians as they age. And this um, slide tells you a little bit about the journey so far. And again, I think this really underscores the um, utility of using CLSA data. When you think about the amount of time to create a cohort and a data resource, a rich resource like this, that is available now to all um, Canadian researchers and trainees. So it did, as I said before, it started in a call for, for proposals in 2001. There was a protocol development phase. There was a, a set of feasibility studies. There was validation work and pilot work. But one of the really important um, points is this orange bar, which is funding that was received from the Canada Foundation for Innovation. And this funding really um, enabled an important aspect of the CLSA, and that is one is that was allow us to create our infrastructure. So we were allowed to construct um, data collection sites across the country that had standardized equipment. We were also able to create um, our enabling units. So we have the National Coordinating Center and the Biorepository and Bioanalysis Center at McMaster. We have the Statistical Analysis Center at McGill. We have a ge genetic and epigenetic center in uh, Vancouver. And we also were able to create the infrastructure to conduct um, computer-assisted telephone interviewing. So the next phase, so before we even got to the data collection phase, there's clearly a decade of work done, but the recruitment happened um, and is completed over a five-year period. And here you can see that we're in, um, in the, uh, well, we're about two-thirds of the way through our first follow-up data collection. So in terms of the study design, um, the target was to collect, uh, was to recruit 50,000 women and men aged 45 to 85 at baseline. And of that 50,000, 20,000 were targeted to be a random sample from within the 10 provinces. And these participants would um, provide data via telephone, through computer-assisted telephone interviewing. And then about 60% of the CLSA sample, or 30,000, were to be randomly selected from geographically restricted areas, but essentially within 25 to 50 kilometers of one of the 11 data collection sites. And the geographic restriction was required because these people provided questionnaire data, but through a face-to-face in-home interview as well as attending one of our data collection sites, whether there was clinical and physical tests done, and if they consented um, to provide biological samples, both blood and urine. And over, I think about 93% of participants were um, consented to provide biological samples. At the bottom of this slide, you can see as well kind of where we are in terms of um, our data collection. So the idea was that we had five years to recruit our sample, but then every three years, we have a new wave of data collection. So as I said, we're about two thirds away through our first follow-up. And in 2018, we'll start into our second follow-up. And so there's actually seven full waves of data planned. And that's our active follow-up, which is done every three years. But there's also then a um, plan to do data linkage to augment our data with passive follow-up. And essentially, um, a part of the, both the um, people who um, conducted the interviews by telephone and in person were asked whether they would be willing to provide their health insurance number and allow us to uh, link with administrative databases. And again, over 90% of participants were willing to do this. So we are in the process of developing the and negotiating how we are going to do this administrative data linkage, which you can imagine is quite a complex undertaking. But that is what we, um, we plan to have as part of the data that will be available as part of the CLSA. And this um, 
this next slide is uh, meant to give you an idea of what our population looks like. So the purple dots represent the people who are part of our telephone interview cohort. Um, they are from the 10 provinces. The red circles identify where our data collection sites are. So although, again, it's not a random sample of the Canadian population, you could see that it represents both the Pacific, the Prairies, Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces where we have our data collection sites. Um, in terms of defining the cohorts, as I said before, we included Canadians that are 45 to 85 years old at recruitment. And the idea here was to capture baby boomers, so the people born between 46 and 64, as well as members of what we call the silent generation. And the idea here is that the healthy aging, and aging may differ a fair bit in terms of the baby boomer cohort than cohorts before. The other thing that this really allows us to do that is different than uh, many of the aging cohorts is uh, many of them focus on the age yet, or they look at aging issues in the older, just focused on older age groups, say 65 and older. Here, looking at 45 to 85 lets us really look at healthy aging and trajectories, not only of diseases, but also how people move along in aging and all the certain, all the specific, you know, physical, social, and psychological aspects of that. In terms of the recruitment, we had three main um, sampling frames. Our first one was part of a partnership with Statistics Canada, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the Canadian Community Health Survey. And the Healthy Aging CCHS was done in 2008 and 2009, and this was actually a collaboration between Statistics Canada and CLSA researchers in terms of developing the content of the CCHS Healthy Aging. But one of the things that is unique to this survey and had never been done before is Statistics Canada also allowed us to use it as a sampling frame. So CCHS participants in the Healthy Aging Survey who would be um, eligible to take part in the CLSA were asked if they would be willing to provide content or their contact information the CLSA researchers so that we could reach out to them and see if they would be interested in participating in the CLSA. We also had partnerships with provincial uh, ministries of health. So in, in provinces where we were able to do this, we used health card registration databases. And for those of you who are familiar with this, it's a fairly complete sampling frame. It's usually about 98% of the population of a province is included in these um, databases. And so here, we would ask the ministries, we would give them age and sex strata, the number of people that we wanted to have uh, uh, invitations sent to. The invitations would come directly from the ministry. And then if people were interested in the CLSA, they would return a consent to contact form to us, and then the CLSA would follow up with them. The third sampling frame that we used was random digit dialing. And we did that through a marketing firm, but we also developed our own infrastructure eventually in the CLSA through our computer-assisted telephone interviewing sites to actually do some of this um, random digit dialing uh, recruitment as well. So in terms of the exclusion criteria, and this is at baseline of the CLSA, essentially it was driven by our first sampling frame, which was the CCHS, uh, healthy aging. And healthy aging excluded residents of the three territories, um, uh, li people living in an institution, living on First Nation reserves, and full-time members of the armed forces, and temporary visa holders. And the CLSA added two criteria. One was um, cognitive um, impairment at baseline again, and this was because we needed to get uh, signed informed consent um, to be in the study over 20 years. 
and those that were unable to communicate in French and English because we had we were only able to have our validated questionnaires in, available in both French and English. Now, again, it's it's underlined here. These are the the exclusion criteria at baseline. Clearly, in a study of aging, we're very much interested in, for example, although it's a community living population at baseline, we're very much interested in. Um, transitions in uh, living arrangements, for example, in um, into long-term care, into other institutions, as well as um, as well as transitions that may um, make it so that people are not able to participate actively on their own. So, for example, cognitive impairment, where we're developing proxy interviews as we move forward. So, although they're excluded at baseline. The intention is to be as inclusive as possible as we move along in our 20 years. Um, just a bit of terminology, and I may have already used these terms before in the talk because we're so used to it in our CLSA, but we call the cohort where we do the telephone interviewing, where we targeted the 20,000, our tracking cohort. And we targeted 20,000. We actually ended up recruiting 21,241. The 30,000 who had an in-home interview and um, came to one of the data collection sites across the country is our comprehensive cohort. Again, we targeted 30,000, but we actually recruited over 30,000, 30,097. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the study content and data collection. And I'm going to spend just a few uh, moments on this slide because I realized that there is a lot to look at here. But I think this is really, again, underscores, when you look at these three pillars, it underscores one of the great strengths of the CLSA in that the breadth and depth of information, because although you could see the clearly the breadth of information here, most of these dots actually represent a, mo a full module that is used to collect information in all of these areas. So in terms of doing interdisciplinary research, the CLSA is really quite, um, quite an amazing resource. So in the first pillar, we have demographic and lifestyle variables. We have most of the socio-demographic variables that you would think that are in most studies. We also have a veteran identifier. In terms of the lifestyle, we have smoking and alcohol consumption. We have nutritional risk in both the tracking and the comprehensive cohort. In the people where we do the in-home interview, the comprehensive, we actually also have a short diet questionnaire, which is kind of a food frequency screener. So we have more in-depth information there. Uh, we collect information on physical activity, healthcare utilization, and medication and supplement use. And again, in the comprehensive, because we're in the people's homes, we actually ask them to bring out all of their prescription and non-prescription um, medications and supplements that they're taking in regularly. And we record specifically the um, drug um, information numbers from those, from those products. So we have uh, extremely uh, rich information about medications that we're in the process of cleaning now. In terms of physical and psychological health, again, you can see that there's general health, women's health, chronic conditions, and then again, in the comprehensive cohort, when they come to our data collection site, there's extensive, more extensive information collected about symptoms of different diseases. We collect information about sleep, oral health, injuries, falls, mobility, pain and discomfort, functional status, and again, in the tracking, we um, have self-reported functional status in the comprehensive. We actually have performance measures that are done at the data collection site. We collect information on activities of daily living, both basic and instrumental, um, cognition, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and life satisfaction. In terms of social health, again, um, it's quite extensive information in this pillar. We collect information on social networks, social support, social participation, and inequality in online caregiving or online communications, 
in care receiving, both formal and informal, and care giving. And there's quite an extensive amount of information, as you can imagine, when we have our baseline cohort from 45 to 85 on labor force participation, as well as retirement planning and retirement status. We also have information on transportation, mobility, migration, built environments, and uh, home ownership. For those people that come to the data collection site on top of that questionnaire assessment, they also have physical assessments. So we collect anthro anthropometric data, as well as you can see the picture in the middle, that's actually our DEXA. So we, we collect information on bone density, body composition, and aortic calcification, um, blood pressure, ECG. We also do a carotid uh, ultrasound and collect information where we can measure the carotid intima media thickness. We do spirometry, uh, vision, and hearing, as well as um, collect information. We have an image or a retinal image from all of our participants and we do the performance testing. So gait speed, uh, balance, and, and uh, grip strength, for example. In the data collection site, we do also an enhanced cognitive battery. So we look at prospective memory as well as additional executive function measures, and we look at reaction time. And for those people who, uh, who uh, consent, we collect biological specimens, so we collect blood and urine. And again, I think over 90% of the participants in CLSA consented to give biological samples. And here again is, um, again, there's a lot of information in this slide, but if you look at the top row, the green row, that is what is currently available in terms of the hematology data. So these data are actually collected at the time of the visit. So there's some processing that is done of the, of the blood, and then it's aliquoted and frozen, and then stored at our biorepository at McMaster. As well, there's um, additional biomarker data that will be available in mid-2018. Um, there's some clinical chemistry biomarkers that will be available for all participants who provided biological samples, and you could see that these biomarkers were specifically collected as ones that are, um, are um, important to the study of aging. Um, within those people uh, that have the clinical uh, biochemistry biomarkers, there's also a sample of 10,000. So these people are selected to essentially be a representative sample of the CLSA within the 30,000 who have genome-wide genotyping. Um, and this is actually done with the same chip that is used in the UK Biobank. Of the 10,000, 1,500 will have um, information on DNA methylation from uh, and epigenetics. And of the 1,500, and, and uh, um, 1,000, again, will have information on metabolomics. And these data will be available, the, the um, data in the blue rows will be available in mid-2018. So just to give you an idea of what our sample looks like, um, the target was to have about 60% of the sample, 45 to 64, because again, we want to follow them for 20 years, and 40% in the older age groups. And you can see here that that is essentially what we were able to, um, to achieve. Um, we were having, the plan was to have about 50-50 males and females. We have 50, almost 51% females, but again, very... Um, even distribution. And in terms of the language of administration, it's about 81% is in English, 18.6% um, of, of the um, interviews were conducted in French, and about 84% of the sample was born in Canada. Again here, looking at the uh, participants by province, you could see that in the tracking cohort, essentially the allocation of the sample, so we wanted to have about 20,000,
but it was essentially done based on the size of the province. So you could see Ontario and Quebec have the biggest sample as part of the tracking. But having said that, we also wanted to make sure there was a minimum number in each of the age sex strata. So in PEI, they were a little bit oversampled. In the comprehensive, the uh, target was to have about 3,000 at each of the data collection sites. So you could see the provinces that had two data collection sites have a little over 6,000. The provinces that had one data collection site have about 3,000. And Newfoundland, because of the uh, population available, had a little bit of a smaller sample size. But that was taken up then in terms of the other data collection sites. So we have, again, the total is still over 30,000. In terms of data access, and I'm going to, again, specifically talk about the baseline data. Um, the CLSA was designed as a research study, but it's funded as a research platform. And our success is really um, if we get Canadian researchers and researchers internationally who are interested in using this resource. It's extremely important that these um, data be used because it is such an important resource and that is available to researchers that can be part of many different programs of research. So who can apply for these data? Um, researchers based in an academic setting and research institutes in Canada and elsewhere can apply. And there's a little asterisk with elsewhere because as yet, um, biospecimens cannot be released to Canadian or to researchers outside of Canada. And what's important as well for the trainees listening today is that graduate students and postdoctoral fellows based in Canadian institutions or trainees uh, studying elsewhere but funded by Canadian, uh, a Canadian agency are able to um, apply for these data. Um, what do you get? So there's the alphanumeric data on all 51,338 participants. Um, there's additional raw data that are, very, uh, that are available upon request. So there's some additional data from the cognitive battery, from the ECG spirometry, for example. Um, there's also de-identified open text for selected variables. And here, um, one thing that, uh, that the CLSA collected, there wasn't a lot of open text, but one thing that was collected was asking people what they thought healthy aging was. So that is available to researchers, as well as some additional um, uh, de-identified open text, for example, in terms of uh, occupation and industry. Um, sampling weights are available. We have sampling weights for the tracking cohort, for the comprehensive cohort, and for the combined CLSA full cohort. And there's also additional, some additional data. As I said, that we are working on um, creating linkages with uh, data from the CLSA. And we currently have some linked data on um, air pollution and meteorologic data that uh, have been linked using uh, with uh, a collaboration with Health Canada. And there's information, there is um, the forward sortation areas or the first three characters of the postal codes that are available upon request. Um, in terms of the steps, um, this, this uh, access at, at cla-elcv.ca is very important. This is where you can apply for the data as well as if you have specific questions about the application process. So you submit the application at preset deadlines. And there's actually one deadline that's coming up in a little over two weeks. Um, the first thing that happens is there's an administrative and statistical review to make sure that the application is complete. It's then reviewed by our data and biospecimen access committee. And the application, their recommendations are approved by or, or reviewed by the senior management team. The, the applicants are then notified and then there is a step 
in um, creating access agreements that are made between McMaster University, who is the custodian of the data and researchers institution. And so the preparation of that and signatures are required as well as ethics approval. And the reason that this is um, important is because unlike um, many of the other data sets that are available, for example, through StatsCan and the non-public use data sets, you have to go to a research data center the CLSA data, you actually will receive the raw data. It is provided to the applicant. So it can go on your computer, but clearly then the agreement has to spell out the security confidentiality and scientific requirements of, of making these data available. So in terms of the data access timeline, you could see here about how long each of the steps takes, but the important one that we have absolutely no control over is the one in the middle, the yellow one. So that is where the access agreements are signed. So that is a negotiation between the institutions to get the signatures, as well as the researcher um, dealing with their own research ethics board to get their ethics approval. And again, that is really where the time frame is quite variable. So especially in terms of people thinking about using these data for a master's or a PhD product, project, it's really important to think about this in terms of the amount of time. So you should plan on receiving the data about six months after the submission deadline. In terms of the cost, it's a par partial cost recovery model. The alphanumeric data are a $3,000 straight fee, um, and that is for alphanumeric data only. Um, the important thing to note, especially for trainees, is that graduate students, there's no cost for a data set if it's used solely for thesis research. And for postdocs, there's no cost for one data set used solely for a postdoctoral project. Um, again, I was saying that the biospecimen data will be available sometime in 2018, and the costing of this is still in development. In terms of um, resources, um, I cannot stress more um, how, how useful it is when you start thinking about using the CLSA, CLSA data to come look at the CLSA website and specifically under the researchers and data access tabs. What you'll find there under the researchers tabs is the protocol, so you get a real idea about you know, the very particulars about the um, study design and the rationale for the, uh, the different instruments chosen, citations for those instruments as well as the data collection tools. So all of the questionnaires are available, and I would highly recommend that you take a look at the questionnaires. Um, the physical assessments, there's information on that. And as well, under this tab, there's data support documentation. So there's documents on different areas, such as the weights, um, such as the cognitive variables, and for example, the um, the linked um, air pollution data. There's additional information about that that will allow you to understand what we've what we've um, what we've collected and what is available, as well as giving you some, you know, information that you really need to use these data effectively. In collab kind of along with that, um, I would recommend that you look at the data preview portal. And generally, when I use this, I use it in well, I have the questionnaire in front of me because I think they're two different parts of information, but extremely important. So here in the data preview portal, you can um, get metadata, which is very high level on variable specific information. So it gives you some information about how the, how the variable is collected, how the question is asked, Sometimes there's a little bit of information about the coding, but it also gives you an idea uh, of how many people have endorsed different, um, different variables. So for example, if you want to look at satisfaction with life, 
you could look up the different variables that we've collected in terms of looking at the area of the information. You could look at the instrument. You could also look at spe specific variables. So it's very helpful in terms of thinking about if you want to look at a research question using CLSA data, you need to make sure that you have the numbers that would be available to you. And it, it can really be quite helpful in terms of thinking about um, what your research question might be. Um, the other thing that is extremely useful is the FAQs. So there's FAQs in the area of data access, uh, the data preview portal. I just gave you a very kind of high level overview, but there's a lot of information about how to uh, navigate that and application questions. And as well, um, if you still have questions after looking at that, um, you can email at access at clsa.elcd.ca. Um, just to give you a quick idea of the approved trainee projects from 2017, um, you could see they're quite diverse, looking at a model of health, looking at metabolic and functional benefits, looking at uh, um, multimorbidity. But as well here, if you look at this uh, word cloud, the keywords, again, I think this really underscores the um, utility of the CLSA in that you can see very strongly represented is um, physical health, psychological health, social health, and really looking at these together in kind of a multidisciplinary way. Um, so the, really the take-home message that I'd like to leave with you is that this is a large cohort. It was designed, assembled, and data collection is ongoing. Um, the baseline data and biospecimens have been collected. And the alphanumeric data from questionnaires, physical assessments, and the basic hematology results are available on all 51,338 CLSA participants. And again, underscoring that these are free for student thesis research and for postdoc uh, post uh, projects. And I would just like to take a moment to thank our funders and recognize our partners. And I will pass the, uh, the mic over to um, one of the trainees who's actually used our data. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Griffiths, uh, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Christy, and I will be sharing with you today my experience with uh, accessing CLSA data and using CLSA data. Um, I'm just, OK, sorry about that. So uh, the outline of my talk will be as follows. A uh, bit of background on myself, uh, the project objectives, and I will go into more details on how to specifically uh, access the data and go through the timeline uh, to order the, the data that's specific for my case. And I'll present the outputs from our project and lastly, some take home messages for you. And I apologize if anything is redundant. Um, to Dr. Griffith's talk. So I'm being uh, currently trained as a chronic disease epidemiologist after dabbling a bit in maternal and child health epidemiology. My research interests include a combination of aging, health behavior, and women's health. I hold degrees in biology and epidemiology from the American University of Beirut. And I'm currently in my fourth year of doctoral studies in epidemiology at York University under the supervision of uh, Dr. Hala Tamim. So uh, my dissertation specifically focuses on understanding how various factors, such as socioeconomic, uh, health behavior, health-related uh, variables, influence um, hormone therapy use and age at natural menopause in Canada. This information is important for the prevention and risk reduction of future morbidity among older women. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the mentorship and guidance of the following people who have been very supportive for my graduate career. They are Dr. Zabla Sibai, Hala Tamim, 
Chris Ardern, Heather Edgell, and my informal mentor, Adina Zaki al -Hazuri. So just a bit of a background on my previous work. Um, my MSc thesis examined the burden and correlates of type 2 diabetes in Lebanon using a large national data set. Results of this study have been published in Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice. During my master's, I also worked on a paper on physical activity among the diabetics that was published in BMC Public Health, as you can see from the screenshots here. Now, these two papers um, are, have been most cited and present a cornerstone of my work so far. So why did I choose to use the CLSA platform for my dissertation? It is also a large uh, nationwide population-based data set and includes rich information on different aspects of aging, chronic disease, and women's health, as you saw. And this really uh, enables uh, my project to be completed. So what is my project about? So the project tackled the epidemiology of menopause in Canada and included two studies. Study one examined the prevalence and factors associated with hormone therapy use, while study two uh, aimed to provide an estimate of the median age at natural menopause and to assess the association of various uh, factors uh, with age at natural menopause in Canada. Um, sorry, I don't know why study two's uh, title isn't appearing, uh, but it's okay. So. Um, I will go through this schematic diagram here with you in details, but first, just an overall summary of the process of ordering the data and accessing uh, CLSA data. So there are five major steps required to gain access to the data, and there are one, submitting an application uh, to the uh, access at CLSA email. Two, uh, the application will be reviewed by the different uh, CLSA committees. Three, there is the step of completing and signing the data access agreement by the different parties. Four, data set preparation and delivery. And lastly, preparing the final report after using the data. So I will uh, go through this. Uh, diagram step by step, and remember this is the timelines that you see are tailored to my experience, so it might differ for you if you order the data. Before you submit the application, it is important to really uh, keep in mind the following while preparing it. So it's important to one, clearly assign the research team members and to distinguish the role. So who's the PI, who's the trainee? Um, so because the PI is the one who has to submit the application and correspond with uh, the CLSA team throughout the study duration. So um, funny story, I made the mistake of sending in my application as a PI because I'm thinking this is for my dissertation, it's my project, when actually I'm the trainee, so uh, we had to submit the application a second time with the PI being my supervisor, and she was the one who sent the first email uh, to uh, the email address access at CELSA, and she was the one who was doing all the correspondence. Uh, it is also important to obtain ethics approval for your project from your institution before submitting the application, and I emphasize on before because this takes more time than you think. Uh, next comes actually, well, oh, um, while preparing the application, uh, it's pretty straightforward, uh, but you have to be mindful of uh, the following. Um, you have to um, you have to make sure which variables are needed when completing the data uh, checklist. So it's useful to go uh, to the data portal and look up the variables and uh, make sure you know the ones that you need. Now, uh, the application is paper-based with a three-page description of the project. 
Um, and just be sure that the application is complete and signed before submitting to the CLSA. Next come, comes submitting the application. So uh, our application was submitted by the PI on March 9, 2016. Um, before getting a final decision on our application, it had to undergo three reviews from three distinct subcommittees of the CLSA. Um, the Administrative Committee, the Statistical uh, Review Committee, and the Data um, and Biospecimen Access Committee reviewed our application. And on July 10, 2016, our application was approved with some recommendations, which were mostly the, um, a depression value. is a complicated one um, because there are a number of parties involved with lots of administrative procedures to be done and we all know these take a while and it was during the summertime when this process uh, occurred in my case and many people were on vacation so trying to get hold of them was um, not so easy. So next we revised the application and um, we revised the application and sent it to the CLSA email address again. Next, we heard from the admi administrative coordinator, who is Roxanne Cheeseman, who then sent the data access agreement to the PI. And this is to be reviewed and completed by the approved user's institution. So a bit of terminology. So uh, once your application is approved, the PI becomes the approved user. Um, so the PI then completed the relevant section of the agreement and then forwards the, the agreement to uh, the Office of Research Services at York for the institution's signature. And uh, this was done by July 25. So um, PIs and the institution's signatures were then obtained on the data access agreement. And this signed access agreement was then forwarded to McMaster via uh, Roxanne Cheeseman. And this data access agreement was then signed by McMaster, more specifically uh, the research office and Dr. Reyna on September 22, 2016. So uh, step four, we hear from the data access officer, who is Dr. Ishvan Molnar Sokach, who is here uh, today with us, uh, very thankfully, uh, to answer any questions you might have. So uh, Ish, as he is known, shared the download link for the data set folder. So this link contains the data in CSV format and its dictionary in Excel format. And he shared this within the very next day upon uh, signing the data access agreement. Now it's important to note that the link expires in seven days and uh, the folder which contains the data can be downloaded as many times as the number of research members there are on uh, the access agreement. So if there are 10 people who signed the data access agreement, then the data can be downloaded 10 times within seven days. Uh, now, the data dictionary is very clear, and uh, the data is pretty straightforward again, but it might be useful for you to uh, label the variables with your own study names uh, in order to personalize the data set and make it easier for you to analyze it. So, for example, um, HRT use duration uh, was labeled in the following way by the CLSA. So WHO, HRT year, what, what not. So I then uh, labeled it uh, in order to make it more helpful and clear for me to use as HRT use duration. So just a small uh, tip for you. Okay, so once you have the data, you will have a specified time period within which the analyses have to complete, be completed. And this is usually within a year of the date that the data was sent. 
and this can up go up to two years. After that, you'll have to submit a final report outlining what variables you recoded, uh, did you derive any new variables, um, and whatnot. So in my case, data handling and cleaning uh, and analysis took me from December 2016 to June 2017. Now, uh, while analyzing the data, it is uh, helpful to be aware of the changes that occur to the data during the time that you're working on it, because these might affect your analysis. So in my case, what happened on February 17, 2017, there was a data release update that was sent to the PI saying, we have added sampling weight strata variables to be used in conjunction with the existing weights as outlined in the sampling weights documentation available on our website. So uh, to make this uh, clear, uh, we had ordered uh, baseline uh, data from the tracking cohort and we were given uh, like the sample weight for that uh, sample, the, the tracking cohort. Um, the variable for the sampling strata weight, however, was not available at the time that we had first ordered the data, but they were made available by February 17, 2017. So since this data release update contained the variable that was important, for uh, the accurate completion of the analysis, we contacted the data officer, data access officer again, Ish, on February 25, 2017, and then he provided those sampling strata variables as a data release update within the same week. So it is also important to note that outputs from the project, uh, once the analysis is done, um, so any manuscripts you have for publication have to be first reviewed and vetted by the scientific management team prior to sending them off for publication. So output one, in my case, was the following paper, uh, which was published in Menopause. And output two is also done and dusted, and it will also be published in Menopause. So take home messages to keep in mind. One, uh, it's, it's important to ensure that the research team's roles are clearly known and assigned. And it's also important to follow up on data release update emails. And it's important to also ensure that the ethics approval is valid throughout your study duration. Uh, it, be also mindful of project time frame and deadlines on when to submit the final report. Lastly, I'd like to add that the self CLSA is a great platform to use and a very rewarding training experience, and I'm very delighted to share this experience with you today. And I'd like to thank uh, the following uh, people and teams who were very helpful uh, throughout this process, and thank you for listening. Any questions, please let me know. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all to our distinguished speakers for your excellent presentations. Uh, so we have some time, uh, maybe take maybe 10 minutes, go into the next hour to uh, open it up for questions. Um, just a reminder that muting remains on, but you can enter your questions and we'll go ahead and uh, read through them and try to address them as they come up. Um, so a couple of people have asked about if the slides are available. Uh, it seems like uh, they will be posted on the CLSA website, um, and you'll receive a notification when they're available. So there is that. All right, the first question, what opportunities are there currently and in the future to study immigrants, ethnic minorities? Maybe uh, Dr. Griffith, you might want to chime in on, on kind of future opportunities for for vulnerable populations? Certainly. Um, one thing that we have, I wasn't able to really go into um, exactly all of the variables that are collected, but we do collect information on ethnicity and on cultural background 
that are available, as well as whether a person was born in Canada and if they did immigrate, what was the year of immigration? And so that data is available. Having said that, um, you do have to recognize that the um, two of the, um, or at least one of the inclusion criteria was being able to speak or be able to conduct the interview in either French or English. So there may be some limitations there in terms of um, depending if you want to study recent immigrants, but I would definitely encourage um, who uh, anyone that is interested in this area to look at the data preview portal and you can kind of get an idea for the numbers of uh, people that we would have in these in these areas. Thank you. So I also want to point out that as I um as somebody here who can field questions, we do have uh, Ishvan Molnar Soltkac, who is our data access officer. He's somebody you'll work with closely if you're uh, uh, requesting data access, and a very good resource here. So another question, is it possible to just request numeric data without the biospecimens? Ish, do you want to field that one? Hi, everyone. Um, hope you can hear me all right. Um, Yes, so uh, the question, I'm trying to find it here, just so that I have it. Well, the, is it possible just to request numeric data without biospecimens? Cur currently, we, we have alphanumeric data from uh, the baseline um, cohort available to researchers. Uh, biospecimens are not yet uh, available, so actually uh, all Current, uh, currently approved projects are using alphanumeric data only. Um, the data checklist uh, that details uh, what data are currently available can be found on our website uh, and you can download it, uh, take a look uh, in combination with using the data preview portal uh, to see if uh, there are modules and variables of interest to you. Uh, but yes, absolutely, you can, uh, you can request alphanumeric data without biospecimens. Thank you. So next question, do you plan on adding more physiologic measures or questionnaires in the future? Um, so I guess this might be kind of a future planning or future opportunities for the CLSA platform. Lauren, do you want to do you want to talk about kind of future possibilities or directions or how things might be added or taken away in the future? Certainly. Um, when I focused on the uh, on the content, I was focusing only on the baseline. And so, for example, in follow up one, we had modules on childhood maltreatment, elder abuse, uh, epilepsy, unmet health care needs, and a couple of additional areas that were included. So, what we try and do is we try and balance. Um, the importance of having the data collected in a similar way so we could look at transitions and trajectories over time with also including new and interesting areas. So the way that we do this is we have a number of working groups in, in all different areas who review our content before every wave and suggest what might be interesting in new content. And if there is new content, um, what might we either not collect just for one wave or um, stop collecting if we don't need it, uh, to have that information every three years? Because essentially, it's a big thing for us. And it, because of a 20-year study, we really want to do everything to keep people in the study and to reduce as much the burden on the participants. So as much as we'd love to have you know, a million things in the study, we have to be very cognizant of, you know, the the most important thing is being able to keep people um, in the study, our participant retec retention. So we do have a mechanism um, to add new content. And, um, but again, we have to balance that with participant burden. Thank you. So another question, is it mandatory to obtain uh, ethics approval before a submission of application, and I might ask as well if you need to have financial um, funding secured before applying. Maybe if you can, you can 
answer that? Sure. Um, so I, I did uh, post a quick reply also in the chat box for anyone who's following along. Um, ethics approval is not required at the time of application to use CLSA data. Uh, we do, however, uh, highly recommend it because um, sometimes for different institutions, ethical applications can take a varying amount of time and uh, this could hold up uh, your approval process because we do not release data until proof of ethics has been received by the CLSA. Um, should your uh, institution not require a full ethical review, um, we just need a, a letter from your institutional review board to, to this effect. Uh, similarly, for funding, you do not need to have funding secured at the time of application. Um, of course, as uh, Dr. Griffith had mentioned in the presentation, uh, for eligible trainees and uh, postdoctoral fellows, uh, there are fee waivers available for uh, the data set. Uh, if you are an approved user who does have to pay uh, the, uh, the fee, um, you do not have to have the funding at the time you apply for uh, access to the data. And can government employees access the data? From Andrea Wan. Uh, yes, government employees can access uh, the data. We do have uh, uh, several approved projects uh, that are being led by uh, government employees in, in various uh, agencies. Ish, I think this one's for you as well. Um, so if you're approved for a project, can you publish more than one manuscript or does it have to be only one per data request? Uh, please, please do. <laughs> Um, the, the CLSA would be would be more than happy if you uh, publish more than one manuscript. Um, of course, we we encourage uh, knowledge translation and the the dissemination of results based on the CLSA data set uh, as much as possible, uh, including uh, of course presentations uh, at conferences, uh, posters. Um, public talks uh, at community centers, for example, uh, as well as uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications. So you can answer what more than one question per data set as long as it's been overviewed in your data access proposal? Th thanks, Carol, for the, for the position. So yes, as, lo as long as your aims have been approved by the Data and Sample Access Committee, uh, you can answer more than one question. And uh, sometimes these projects evolve as you are doing the research and a new aim um, pops into the picture. We do have a mechanism to add another aim or a new aim uh, or change an existing aim uh, using uh, an amendment form that you can request through the access email. And uh, it will be reviewed by the DSAC committee and um, you should be able to incorporate it into an already approved project. Thank you. So we have another question. Um, what would be the procedure for getting biomarkers measured that are not on your hematology or chemistry list? Um, Dr. Griffith, do you want to talk about bioassessments? Certainly. Um, I think that in terms of the process for this, I would recommend that um, that if someone is interested in this, that they contact the um, the biorepository and bioanalysis center. Um, there are some um, restrictions to this in terms of you know where these um, where the biomarker analysis can be uh, take place and and not necessarily where it can take place, but more specifically about the process and the quality um, indicators that need to be involved with that. And, and really to understand that more fully, I would recommend co um, contacting the biorepository and bioanalysis center. Thank you. Um, maybe, Dr. Griffiths, you're probably the best person to talk about how we base questionnaire information on, how it was developed? Uh, are we talking about the determinants of health being really the, the pushing uh, background on what questions got entered, included? Certainly. There was, as I, as I kind of alluded to before, 
there was um, working groups that had experts in many different areas, including um, there's a clinical working group, psychological health working group, social working group. Um, there's um, a lifestyle uh, work, working group, as well as others. And so essentially each working group identified the um, questionnaires that were um, most appropriate to include in the CLSA at baseline. And essentially what we wanted was to have instruments that were well validated, ones that could be administered by telephone or face-to-face, uh, ones that were um, applicable to the age group that we had at baseline, so 45 to 85, and um, essentially ones that were including important areas, in, including novel areas of research that have not yet been really fully understood. And that was the working groups were tasked with that, and then the the senior management team then worked with that to try and devise the final content. So it was really quite a, it was a long-term and a collaborative process in terms of identifying the content. And as you kind of saw those pillars in one of the slides, it was really important to make sure that um, there was um, at least a, a, a reasonable representation of many different areas of health, especially and in, in including the social determinants of health. Thank you. Um, and from Andrea Wang, thanks for bringing up the uh, the question back to the front here. Uh, can we talk about why First Nations were excluded from the study as a baseline exclusion and perhaps maybe also territories? Sure. Again, that was based on our first sampling frame which was the Canadian Community Health Study uh, or survey on, on healthy aging. And that was essentially, that was their exclusion criteria. And so that became the CLSA's exclusion criteria because those were, that was the first sampling frame. Um, having said that, there certainly is interest in, in researching these populations. And, you know, at least personally, I would hope that there may be some opportunities to collect some CLSA-like data. It may be done in a, in a very different way in terms of collecting it from some of these areas, but it would be, I think, ideal to get some, um, some additional maybe sub-cohorts as we, as we move along. But that's, um, you know, that would be certainly in the future. Future opportunities, perhaps, yeah. Absolutely. Christy, maybe you can actually uh, address a couple of these questions about how uh, what it's like to go through a couple of these review processes. Um, uh, Asha asked about the pre-journal submission review, uh, what kind of components are reviewed and how long that takes. And um, Andrew Wang also asked about uh, the statistical review that happens during the proposal process. Um, okay. Uh, for, for the first question, uh, before submitting uh, the your product to uh, for vetting, so basically you just submit uh, the draft of the paper that you plan to submit for publication to the CLSA uh, scientific committee, mainly Drs. Kirkland, uh, Raina, and uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, for them to review a draft of. Uh, your paper to see the results of your analysis and to approve of uh, what you've done uh, before submitting uh, this paper for publication. And this usually takes up to two or three weeks maximum um, for you to hear back on the status. Uh, regarding statistical review, uh, so this step entails basically reviewing whether the proposed plan of analysis, um, so how do you plan to answer your research question is statistically sound, so whether uh, the techniques that will be uh, applied uh, are relevant um, and whether they fully answer uh, the research question. Thank you. And then I think a very important question, uh, are there any funding opportunities to support new investigators to access the CLSA data? Dr. Griffith? 
Um, certainly. There actually was a recent catalyst competition to use CLSA data. But in addition to that, it should be, um, I should emphasize that um, um, the, the um, funds required to access CLSA data is an allowable expense on, um, on, um, for Canadian funding. So if, even if you're doing, you're proposing a, a whole different project, if a component of it is to use CLSA data, that is an allowable expense for CIHR. Thank you. So that was 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, I'm sure that everybody for our presenters will stay on the line and uh, answer all the questions, but I just want to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is October 16th, as our presenters mentioned. Uh, visit our CLSA website under data access to review the available data for further information and for details about the application process. You can also contact basically all of our um, presenters, particularly uh, particularly Ish and myself for any of the presenters for more information about how to, to do data access. Also, our next webinar is scheduled for October 12th, 2017 at noon Eastern time. We'll be welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Badley and Dr. Anthony Perusio to discuss osteoarthritis, not just a new system condition of old age, an overview of findings from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So please register soon and join us for our next month webinar. So going back to the questions, um, can data access be refused and based on what criteria? Uh, Ish, do you want to field that? Sure. Um, we we try to work with um, applicants uh, as far as possible to enable data access to the CLSA platform. Um, data access can be uh, refused in cases, for example, where an application is too early uh, to ask the question that it's proposing to ask. For example, we only have baseline data available. No longitudinal question can be answered at this stage um, when further data points for follow-up one, follow-up two data become available. Longitudinal questions may be asked, for example. Um, Sometimes uh, a very specific population uh, or segment of the population is proposed to be studied and perhaps uh, the statistical review determines that the sample size for that particular uh, segment of the population is not large enough um, to uh, allow a valid uh, response to the proposed question. In that case also, for example, the the access to the data um, uh, could be refused. Uh, so those are some situations. But each each application is considered based on its own own merits. Um, and uh, uh, so, as I said, if you if you we try to work with with researchers even before the application as much as possible to enable data access. So please, if you have any questions before you submit your application, don't hesitate to email us on the access email. And um, again, these, these um, slides as well as the recording will be available on the CLSA website uh, soon, and feel free to distribute and share those. Uh, another question, uh, how many applications are there um, annually? Application deadlines are there annually, and what are they? Um, Ish, maybe that's for you again. There, there are three uh, application deadlines annually. So. Uh, the last application deadline for 2017 is uh, October 16th, and the 2018 application deadlines are already posted on our website. They are January 29th, June 11th, and September 24th. Okay, so I'm going to thank everybody for uh, joining us today, and uh, if you have any further questions, please send them to our access at CLSA. ELCV.ca uh, website, and we'll be happy to uh, respond. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's webinar.